Um, I'm Patrick Duffy, I'm with Cardinal. So we wanted to get into a little more detail about um, managing your shoreline and the various things that go into that. First, I wanted to um, describe for you who Cardinal is, what we do. We're actually a relatively large company, more than 100 offices in North America providing environmental engineering, geotechnical and infrastructure work. So we were involved in a project in Indianapolis, actually. They were doing a, some kind of a pipeline operation that necessitated archaeological study on several urban sites, and we helped them develop the methodology for that. Uh, my branch of Cardno provides full scope uh, ecological restoration services, um, from consulting and assessment, design, implementation, and follow-up. So on the consulting side, two of the Two of the more pertinent services that we provide include wetland delineations and permitting. So I was working with someone last year who, uh, he was a, a developer. He bought a house, he wanted to flip it. He needed to tie into a storm drain. He got a permit with water and sewer. He tied it into the storm drain and then found out later that he had not gotten the appropriate permits. He called us right away. We did the appropriate delineation and restoration work and his work was still delayed about six months. So we find that people are benefited from contacting us up front and having us consult for them um, whenever you're doing something that may impact a wetland area. And we do that in, uh, there's other forms of that type of work on varying scales. So mitigation banking is interesting in that it, it's basically looking at a potential development. And the acronym there is the Great Miami Mitigation Bank, which is one that we did in Ohio. They're looking at doing a 350 acre metro park. So they have to look at where might we put that park and how much wetland damage would be incurred by doing that park. And they have to plan for offsetting that damage by creating or rehabilitating wetland air area elsewhere. So we helped design that for them and, and did a geographically explicit database and management plan for them and that. A natural resource damage assessment, which is an NRDA there, is, is kind of a different flavor of that involving maybe you're doing an oil drilling operation and you're involved with NOAA and having to assess what potential damage is incurred and how that might be mitigated. Uh, we also do a variety of species assessments. So Eric mentioned using an EPT index, Ephemeroptera, Trichoptera, Placoptera, um, stream macroinvertebrate um, measurements of water quality. We do that, plant surveys, bird surveys, reptile surveys, fish surveys for a variety of management planning needs. And then of course we also do the actual implementation of restoration efforts always in conjunction with our native plant nurseries. So we provide custom seed and plant mixes to fit the site, to fit the budget, to fit client expectations. So we offer many services. Some of them include invasive species management, um, native landscaping and stormwater management, so implementation of a, a rain garden or a bioswale, a detention basin, a retention basin, the design, construction, and maintenance of those. And then shoreline management, shoreline erosion control, um, and rehabilitation is another service that we provide. So having said all that, one of the main issues that you deal with as a riparian property owner is uh, invasive species. So I thought the best way to get into that is to define what makes an invasive species invasive in the first place. And my favorite way of describing that is by using the enemy release hypothesis, which basically says, says that you have, say, garlic mustard, for example, from Europe, and someone brings it here and plants it in their garden so that they can have it for their salads. But in doing so, now it lacks some of its native pathogens, viral, bacterial, or, fun or fungal, uh, maybe some of its predators, uh, macroinvertebrates or vertebrates. So deer, for example, around here love to eat oak and beech and do not prefer to eat garlic mustard. So you have a situation in which that invasive species is not being fed upon and over time it's uh, another invasive species. They tend to leaf out earlier. They tend to senesce or drop their leaves later. They tend to reproduce very effectively. So they form a monoculture and a monoculture effectively reduces structural uh, heterogeneity in the landscape. There's Basically, it homogenizes the landscape in such a way that where there otherwise would be all kinds of spaces for varying species to equally compete for food and shelter. Now there's one type of landscape. In the case of Phragmites, now you have a lot more red-winged blackbirds. 
for example. So it has a distinct <coughs> negative impact on biodiversity over time. It can also have an economic impact. So Phragmites is, again, another good example of that because it can grow so tall that it, uh, it obstructs your view sheds and has a direct negative impact on your property value. Having said that, I wanted to just touch on a couple of the common invasive species you'll be dealing with, which are listed here. I'll go through each one of them in a little bit of detail. So Phragmites is Phragmites australis, or common reed, introduced from Europe in the 1800s, likely through ballast water. And you'll find a lot of these were actually introduced sometime in the 1800s. Can grow very tall, but to add to what I've already said, it also increases fire risk on your property. So it's highly flammable. Flame lengths can be twice the height of the plant. Uh, fire from Phragmites can spread very quickly. So it can be of concern. Also, when managing stormwater, uh, stormwater management devices like detention and retention basins, they tend to grow very well in those areas. And they put on a lot of biomass, which dies, and over time, year after year, that partially decomposed fibric material uh, clogs your drains. And they end up having to be dredged out, which is very expensive. Um, so really, the rule of thumb with managing invasives um, in that scenario and in other scenarios is to get on it as soon as you identify that you have a problem because it only gets more expensive to deal with um, the longer that you wait. Speaking on managing, anytime we talk about managing a pest species, we talk about integrated pest management, which means to use all of the tools that we have available to us to manage that species. Chemical treatments work. Using herbicide will work on Phragmites as an example, but there are problems with just using that one treatment. You can potentially develop pesticide resistance as a result. You have to stick under EPA label rates when you're applying herbicide. You don't want to put too much chemical on the landscape. Uh, so we combine also mechanical treatments, which includes mowing. Um, I've talked to a lot of landowners, recently in particular, who have tried their own version of, of using mechanical treatments and chemical treatments. So I talked to someone today. Um, she mixed dish soap and salt and applied it to her cattail. And it, the, the plant that she applied it to looked very unhealthy. But the reason for that is likely because she applied effectively a salt on the leaf surface, which switched the osmotic potential. And it was just the plant was drying up. Water was being pulled out of the plant. But over time, over a large scale, it isn't really an effective solution. And you don't want to apply a bunch of soap into a wetland area, a bunch of antimicrobial product into a wetland area, particularly not without a permit. Um, and mechanical treatments, I've spoken to a lot of landowners who have tried cutting Phragmites themselves. And most of them experience something like cutting their lawns, where you keep cutting it and it keeps coming back. And sometimes it comes back thicker and more widespread than it was before. And the reason for that is because of its hormonal control. It has a hormone in its crown, auxin, that can regulate the activity of hormones in its roots, cytokinins and gibberellins. So when you cut it, you're telling the plant to sprout, to spread further out from where it currently is. And it becomes a more um, costly problem down the road. So what we like to do that's very effective is combine a chemical treatment within a follow-up mowing treatment and do that year after year and keep um, monitoring the population. And as that declines, we include cultural control, which does include prescribed burning, but it includes choosing the right plant species for the site and cultivating the site in such a way that it facilitates the growth of native plants and does not facilitate the growth of invasives. So the more Phragmites grows in an in, in area, it can alter the substrate in such a way to facilitate its own growth, which is called a feedback loop. And that's something that we um, want to avoid. I've listed biological control here, too, and that's an interesting topic. Um, to do biological control, essentially, we talked about the enemy release hypothesis. So you'd take a biological agent, a beetle, for example, uh, a gall midge that would feed on Phragmites, and you study it and release it, and you hope that it feeds only on Phragmites. So what you want to avoid is releasing a biological agent that feeds on a lot of things and decimates native populations. So it takes years of study 
before a biological agent can be effectively used. I listed two here because there happen to be some natives and some incidental non-natives that do feed on Phragmites, but they don't lower the population in any um, notable way. The uh, next one's Japanese knotweed or Fallopia japonica, again introduced in the 1800s. It was sold in nurseries and is not anymore. Um, can also get quite tall. So they're, they're similar in the way they behave on the landscape and the way they're managed in some ways. Not as high a fire risk with this species, and it's also not quite as widespread as Phragmites, but it is allelopathic, which means that it releases a chemical from its roots that inhibits the growth of other plants, which is called chemical competition. When we talk about managing this plant, um, we use similar methodologies. We found though, and I've done some research on this, and there are several reputable sources that vary slightly in the recommendations, but we found glyphosate, for example, to not be the most effective means of controlling this. We use imidacloprid. So, it can be tricky when trying to treat an invasive species to choose your own herbicide, to choose the time of year that you're doing it, uh, to try and do the work yourself. And most of the individuals who I talk to who attempt this aren't necessarily having a lot of success in doing so. The third one is glossy buckthorn. Um, Slightly different in that it's a woody shrub. It has high seed viability, so it tends to spread more via its seed, bird spreading its seed versus Phragmites. It spreads quite well through its roots. And I would argue it's easier to manage in that you can cut it later in the year, pile it, and apply smaller amount of concentrated chemical that affords you a greater degree of control over the, the use of the herbicide there. I was peripherally associated with a study that I thought was interesting, looking at a fen complex and the presence of glossy buckthorn. And they actually showed that where there's glossy buckthorn, it tends to take up enough water to lower the water table measurably, which means it's creating slightly drier soil conditions around the plant, which facilitates its own growth, which creates more dry soil conditions. So that's another example of a, like a feedback loop. Support. Yes. Uh, I, I've uh, pretty much handled the frag waves on my own with a chemical and things of that nature. Is the same thing, would the same thing work on, on uh, buckthorn, which I've noticed is on my property as well? Tends to be that triclopyr works very well, and triclopyr is, a, is specific to broadleaf plants, whereas glyphosate is, is the more common thing that people use, but it's non selective. So it'll kill quite a, a a larger number of species. So brush Good. Feed. I'm sorry? So brush feed dye, right? You know, I couldn't tell you the, the name of the ready to use formulations because that's not the, the types that we use. I'd have to, I'd have to look into it. <laughs> Another one is purple loose strife. Um, introduced as an ornamental. Uh, Sources say it can grow taller than I've observed it to be, but it, it states that it can grow up to 10 feet tall. Oh, you have not seen that one, right? No. Okay. I've seen one. You have? Yeah. Really? That's, that's what the research suggests. We don't tend to find them quite as tall. Higher seed viability. The, I think what's interesting about purple loosestrife, one of the interesting things about it is you can actually hand pull if you don't mind getting into the wetland area. Um, but in this case, they actually did find biological control agents that were effective that were released in 1992. So a couple of leaf-eating beetles and a, a root-boring weevil. And the, the intention for that, obviously, is not to get rid of purple loosestrife altogether. It's to reduce it to a population level that's similar to its native analog. It's similar to the native plant community so that they're sort of coexisting. Because getting rid of a, an invasive plant, extirpating it, isn't feasible is uh, almost impossible. So that isn't generally our, our goal in management. And it worked. I've been on Deer Lake for years. I had the most beautiful stand of purple loose <laughs> Before I knew it was so bad. The beetle came along, gone. Fantastic. But they're shooting up 
few every once in a while around the lake now. I thought it was because the beetle had run out of food that it liked. What it liked to eat, and that's why we don't have the beetles anymore. Hmm. The beetles are coming back, though. Are they? Yep. You don't know that? Okay. I was Pre just curious. Uh, what I do now is I, you know, I saw one last summer. Oh, yeah. I it and I dab it. That's good. That's it. <laughs> there tends to be a predator prey cycle, so they, they go in waves. Um, yeah. But all I thought of the it was beautiful at one time. I really did. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the hope for many of these invasive plant species that we deal with is that we can develop biological controls that can be cost effective and manage them similar to uh, this example with purple loosestrife. So dealing with invasive species is just one of the issues you deal with managing shoreline property. I think that's going on automatic. So we want to talk about a few other issues that are involved in shoreline management. Um, and Eric actually touched on this a little bit, but common issues that I want to talk about, invasive species, aquatic ecosystem degradation, and erosion. And that's just a picture of eutrophication here, where you have um, excess fertilizers or sewage leaking into your, your lake and forming algal blooms. That leads to anoxic zones that can kill off fish and other animals living in the water. Um, the leading causes for this, poor stormwater management, reduction in native vegetation, and fertilizing of your lawns. Also, seawall construction is a problem that I wanted to touch on as well. So in terms of stormwater management, and Eric, again, touched on this, but water, rainwater is going to hit the surface. It's going to evaporate, be taken up by plants, um, infiltrate into the soil surface, or run off. If it runs off, it's going to carry the salts and pollutants or fertilizers from your landscape. If it runs from an impervious surface onto your lawn, which is turf grass is short rooted, it's not going to infiltrate a lot of that water and a lot of that is going to run right off into your wetland area, which also can increase erosion there. So proper stormwater management is important. Um, it can mean planning for infrastructure uh, as far away from that wetland area as possible. It can mean also and this is more of a cost-effective means, is planning a riparian buffer of native vegetation and considering bioengineered controls to manage that stormwater. Um, another point I guess I wanted to add here is when you have that turf grass right up to your, your shoreline, you have short-rooted um, turf grass that's not holding soil in place. You also invite waterfowl like Canada geese. They like that environment very much, yeah. which also lowers your property value. And actually, in terms of stormwater management, you can plan for rain gardens at your, at your water's edge as well. That's something that you can also implement that can add property value. It can be done in such a way that it looks like a, a landscaped parabola, basically. It can be very nice looking. I'll have some examples of shoreline projects that we've done. Um, and Eric actually has a pamphlet over here that shows this graphic, and we like this graphic a lot because it shows you the, the distinct difference between turf grass and its rooting strategy and that of native plants, which tend to have much deeper uh, roots that hold soil and water in place better. On seawalls in particular, so the, the issue with seawalls is not that they're not effective in curbing erosion, it's that they're <laughs> expensive. And when the wave action hits against the seawall itself, it travels downward and it travels outward. When it travels outward, it scours around the edge of the seawall and causes erosion there. When it scours downward, when it heads downward, it scours the substrate at the bottom. And that disturbed soil environment provides, uh, often provides a competitive opportunity for invasives like Eurasian water milfoil. We've also seen seawalls constructed poorly, which does happen on occasion, uh, where um, they were designed to have sand backfill behind the seawall, and instead this person was trying to cut costs and they did partial sand and partial soil from on site, which was high in clay content. The clay content didn't have the pore space and compression capability that it was meant to have. And so the seawall itself is, is taking more of the erosive forces from that water environment, which makes it more likely to fail over time. Also, if they're not constructed correctly and the scouring at the bottom eventually can lead the toe of the seawall to fail as well. And Ecologically speaking, 
this um, wetland upland interface is important for many species in order to complete their life cycles. Turtles need both the wetland and the upland to complete their life cycle. So when you put a wall in the way, they're not able to do that. So it has a distinctly negative ecological impact. I have a question. Yes. Will a riprap wall do a similar thing, or is it? So a seawall is an engineered control. We were going to talk about bioengineered controls, which are kind of somewhere in the middle of just um, plants. Uh, riprap is maybe closer to an engineered control, but we often use riprap. It just depends on the erosive forces at play. So, and that's actually what I was just going to touch on there. Um, when we talk about curbing erosion, we always talk about a, a native riparian buffer because those plant roots hold soil in place. We also talk about other bioengineered controls. And I just wanted to, I wanted to give you an uh, a definition of that because I thought that might be helpful. So bioengineering is an applied science that combines the use of engineering design principles with biological and ecological concepts to construct and assure the survival of living plant communities that will naturally control erosion and flooding. So what's more than implied in that is that we rely on native plants and native communities in order to stabilize these riparian environments in conjunction with other materials. So those other materials can include riprap. Uh, the material that we will choose depends on the erosive forces in part. So if we're, we're dealing with a high energy environment, we need to possibly incorporate some riprap in that environment to stabilize the shore. But we're always, always looking at the costs versus the risks. If we have a situation in which native plants alone could do the job, or maybe it's a situation where we're comparing some riprap and native plants and core material, which is a coconut fiber that's designed to be biodegradable over time. Um, we consider carefully what the risk is of using this versus that option. What's the ecological impact of using riprap or seawall or just native plants, and native plant roots. And then cultural issues here uh, refers to what do people expect to see? Sometimes on a shoreline, people want a clear view shed with very short growing vegetation like turf grass and we can work with that we can work within those expectations and with budgetary expectations to put a custom seed mix that's low growing that still does its job at, at holding soil in place so to that end what i was hoping to do was show you what some of these bioengineered controls uh, look like give you some pictures of some of the projects that we've done so that you get a clear picture of, um, of this. So first being soil lifts um, in conjunction with other techniques actually. So here's a high wave energy environment. And so we use riprap at the toe and then brush mattressing. Hmm. There, brush mattressing, which is where we laid down brush on, on the soil surface and, and anchored it down. And then we vegetate it so that over time you can't see that brush at all. It's simply holding soil in place. And then we encapsulated soil in this coconut fiber material to hold that in place and did it in a stepwise function so that water coming upslope down in the wetland environment is slowed and infiltrated. And we vegetate this entire slope. And on the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, this is another example using high tensile strength core log in a stepwise fashion for the same purpose. Over time, it should fill in and look something like this. And the, the seed mix here was chosen uh, based on the site. It's a very natural looking site. It's not someone's backyard. It's not necessarily high in flowering, in, in forbs, in color, uh, pretty flowers, showy flowers. It just depends on the expectations of the property owner and the, the forces at play there. Here's a better example of brush mattressing where in this case we used uh, core log material, uh, erosion control blanket material, and brush mattressing. And you can see how that's anchored down. And then it's all vegetated so that over time, it's, it just looks like plants next to a stream. Heather, what's the scale there? What are we looking at? How wide is that water bag? That waterbed is probably four feet wide or less. That's a small scale. Without 
very much weighed action. I'm just, you know. That's a low energy, energy environment, because, yeah. Um, I have experience with the core logs. Uh, Bob and I did it 12 years ago on our 90 feet of our shore. And um, with all of the wave action, and, all, and we put the grasses in all the native plants. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you can see all the roots of the plants, thank goodness. But it is not a very attractive site. Ah. Um, so I want to. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Know, because we have a section of only 17 feet to do that is adjoining to neighbors. Mm -hmm. What do you know about Enviro blocks to plant in instead of core, the, the core blocks? I have limited experience okay. with Enviro blocks, but I know people that I work with that do. Okay. I'd love to get in touch with you after and get yeah, you and some I'm info sorry, on I, that. I went off to my own personal interest. That's That's no problem. Actually, over the last 12 years, we've done, as land managers, a lot more work with this core material and with these bioengineered techniques, and we've learned a great deal more. And so the, the likelihood of, of a, a poorly performing project is significantly lower than it was a couple of decades ago when maybe they were first using these materials. Yeah. The reason we even have riprap here may be because there's a risk of flash flooding here. And the erosive forces that could be at play don't reflect this current <laughs> small stream, which is what I suspect is the case at, at this project site in particular. The next one is a log vein. So this is something that can be used um, on a lake situation. You might put a log jutting out into the lake if you have a problem with sediment transporting laterally along the lake shore. And effectively, you put a log or a rock or riprap out into the stream environment or lake environment and anchor it down. And it, uh, in a stream environment, it directs the flow of the water to avoid, in this case, erosion to this shore, this boat launch area here. Um, in, a, in a lake environment, it can help avoid transport of, of silt downstream or laterally along the shoreline of the lake. And this is another material. This is Silt Socks is a brand, but there's, there are a couple of brands that they look like pantyhose. They're basically tubes of, of plastic type fibrous material that you fill with something like a soil media that you then, so they're very heavy and heavy duty. They're not designed to be biodegradable. They can be placed at the toe of a stream or wetland area to stabilize that environment. Uh, they differ in that it's, it's more energy intensive, more costly than, than core material and not biodegradable. So not quite as environmentally friendly, but quite useful and um, effective in curbing erosion. And then I wanted to show you some examples of uh, some of the other projects that we've done. So in this case, you have a relatively low energy environment with some riprap where we simply use native plant roots to stabilize the shore there. Um, in this case, this is about a 50% 50 50 mix of graminoids, so bulrush and grasses and sedges, and 50% mix of flowering plants here. Uh, in this case, the landowner chose something that was much more heavy in flowering plants, and you have this very pretty arrangement of flowers and a, a reasonable shoreline buffer here around this pond. And in this third example, this is just a, it's maybe a cheaper seed mix utilizing riprap and um, a, a graminoid heavy mix, so grasses and sedges, on this uh, hillside here. The last example I wanted to show, uh, we, after a remediation project, remeandered a stream utilizing heavy strength core log and erosion control blanket. Um, and this is what it looked like during construction. And three years later, this is what it looks like just before we remove the stakes from that area. So you can't see the core log, you can't see the other materials that we put on site. And that's the intention, is that it'll fill in and look like a normal native plant community um, that's ecologically beneficial.